that real boy. It's full steam ahead for the river boat's scrawny life and a great river adventure. But first, a word about the plant that wasn't there. The last time I was on this channel in late summer, I couldn't see the banks. The lotus was fully emergent and completely covered the channel almost. And when I got down closer to the lake where the current slows down a little bit, it was so thick I, I simply could not push the boat through it any further and had to turn back. And you hear that in drought years, it doesn't germinate. But just to see it completely empty like this is just, just leaves me scratching my head. I was very surprised to see no lotus in the channel at all. And when I got down a few bends, I could, I could see clear down to the Lake Odessa campground. And it, for all I could see, there was no lotus in the lake. So maybe we'll do a feature on lotus some other time. But fortunately for now, there are lots of other interesting plants in the Mississippi River Valley. This is cardinal flower, and if you thought it looked a little bit like lobelia, you are correct, because this is lobelia cardinalis in the Campanulacea family. And here we have hibiscus lavis, which is a native in the Malvasia, the Mallow family. And the common name for this is the Halberd Leaf Rose Mallow. Quite an interesting name. Uh, you'll notice, of course, the Mallow family with the five petaled flowers and the five sepals. And this, as you'll notice here, is insect pollinated rather than hummingbird pollinated. And kind of interestingly, this is a Malvasia or Mallow that grows in marshes, therefore a marsh mallow, which kind of makes you wonder how did a confection made out of corn syrup and whatnot become called by that name. But yeah, this is the true marsh mallow, although I doubt if anyone will be making s'mores out of it anytime soon. And now, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce the sole surviving member, the iconoclast, the joker, the anti-hero, the street-fighting, tackle-busting, heavyweight champion, the high king of the lowlands, the bowfin. This is a fish that deserves but seldom receives all manner of accolades and superlatives. It can breathe both water and air. And as you can see, it's a heavily built, very strong, very muscular fish. Look how strongly built its mouth is. Look at the tail. Just look at the tail. Have you ever seen a fish with a tail that looks that strong? And during the spawn, the males can turn a vivid blue-green color. These are a fish that, once found, are not that difficult to catch with bait, but catching one on a fly rod is much more difficult. When hooked, they can jump completely clear of the water. I once hooked one on bait with a rod holder pounded down into the sand, and it jumped, fell back in the water, immediately jumped again, fell back in the water, immediately jumped again, and kept doing this until it had pulled the rod holder out of the sand, drug the rod into the water as I'm running down the levee to get back to the rod, and just swam off with it. But they frequently hunt by scent. If you look closely, just above the mouth, you'll notice two little nostrils that actually protrude out of the head of the fish, kind of like a, the whiskers of a catfish. Those two nostrils act like the forked tongue of a snake, in that it can tell which direction a scent is coming from. So they frequently hunt by scent. They are generally not thought of as a good fish to eat. And sure enough, as I'm paddling down the channel, I could hear someone pounding on something, 
And I thought to myself, oh, I hope they're not catching both in and then beating them to death. But, but of course, the, as I rounded the bend, there was a guy there catching a fish, and he called out, oh, it's just an old dogfish, and proceeded to beat it to death. And I was about to yell out, hey, don't be a fish racist. But it was a black man, and he may not have appreciated the analogy, so I held my tongue. But these fish are native fish. They were here when the Native Americans were here. They've been here since the end of the Ice Age. And fish like bass or pike or walleye aren't going to be useful in controlling invasive fish populations, such as the common carp, because they inhabit different types of water. Whereas fish like bowfin and gar inhabit the same water where, say, a baby carp would be found, and could be useful to people in controlling their populations. But I'm not preaching down at, at the, the man. He uh, had walked a long ways down the levee carrying, you know, heavy fishing tackle. He was probably the kind of person I would like in all other respects. So I don't blame him for being disappointed if all he was catching were both in. But on the other hand, that's probably an outdated evaluation of these fish that we should leave in the past. So originally I had planned to fish the deep edge of emergent lotus in the lake, but as the lake came into view and there didn't appear to be any lotus, I decided to move back up the channel. After I caught a few carp and so forth, but afterwards I, I went back up the channel because I knew there were at least some bowfin in the channel. I came back up to the blowdowns that man had been fishing and he had left. I don't know why I really expected there to be fish there. I didn't didn't turn the camera on or anything. But sure enough a bowfin shot up off the bottom, grabbed the fly and the fight was on. And because the water was so low, he didn't uh, he didn't have much room to run. He couldn't dive so I did manage to get him in the net fairly quickly. So I paddled over to the opposite bank and he calmed down after a little bit. So there he is, my first bowfin on fly. And that's, this is a fish I've been chasing on and off for a long time. And generally, I was using flies designed for fishing in heavy weeds, but they weren't that great for hooking a, a difficult fish because there, there aren't very many soft parts in the mouth of this, these fish. But it was always either the water was a little muddy and the bowfin were hunting entirely by scent and ignoring the fly, or if I took the time to find clear water, I would get strikes but lose the fish during the fight. This year, with very little lotus, my friend Fish and Dave, whom you can find at F I S H, the letter N, D A V E, dot blogspot dot com. He's just out there in the St. Louis area, quietly being one of the best warm water fly fishermen. He began having quite a bit of success with bowfin on fly using 20 pound fluorocarbon instead of wire and heavier flies than anything I had previously tried. And he was experimenting with scent, which I decided to try because if I invested three or four hours driving from Des Moines to the Mississippi and a couple more hours finding some bowfin, it's tough to walk away if they've gone into scent feeding mode. So every third or fourth cast, I was dousing the fly with Potsky's catfish nectar. Although the bowfin I landed clearly saw the fly and it charged it the way a, a, an ambush predator would. So I'm not sure the scent made any difference in that case, but the catfish simply would not leave the fly alone, and I'm fairly sure it made a big difference with the catfish. So the hook is a super sharp hook designed for fishing soft plastics for bass, and that's attached to an articulation shank 
with a heavy dumbbell tied on. And it's dressed with sculpin wool and some ostrich hurl dyed black. And there's no wire leader, just a 20 pound cigar fluorocarbon. And I'm using a sinking line just because that's what I had on it for pike. Uh, probably a floating line would have worked. And this is Chad Mason's 8 weight White River Heat. So that rod is still in service. And for all my talk about how great of a fighter the bowfin is, the good old channel catfish still gives a pretty good account of itself too. So that's what it's like fly fishing the backwaters of the Mississippi River. So let's jump right on into the amateur mycology. Uh, we've got two recipes this time, so we're going to have to rush through this. I found some Herisium abiatus. Although it, you might not, it looks a little different than it normally does because it's been such a drought year. And it sat for a couple days in my refrigerator before I could get around to using it. So we're kind of trimming off some of the parts that look a little worse for wear. Rinsing it down good. And after that it looked pretty good. So we're going to put down a, a dry mix and a wet batter. And we're going to go dry, wet, dry. And then do a chicken fried parisium. And the common name is uh, Bear's Head Tooth. Uh, and that turned out pretty good. It needs a good sauce. But uh, yeah, the chicken fried herisium is not too bad. That's probably, it's not really a mushroom that I eat very often because I don't really like it that much. But yeah, that's probably the best, the best recipe. And then I made a little hand pie. Now in this case, I'm not cooking the filling because it's going to cook fast enough. But if you were doing, say, like a maitake, and say, like, a, to some pork strips or something mixed in with it, and some heavier vegetables like uh, carrots or something, then you would want to pre-cook the filling before stuffing it in the crust. But in this case, I just chopped it up with some onions and, and uh, stuffed it raw right into the crust and fried it in it. Came out pretty good, yeah. That was that was quite good. Also, probably yeah, probably my my uh, second favorite uh, Parisium recipe right there. I guess I'd give that a uh, maybe a seven out of ten. And I'd give the chicken fried one a seven out of ten too. I guess needs a good sauce. All right, well, I guess we didn't need to rush quite that much. We've still got a minute left here. So we might as well look at a few odds and ends in, of the mushroom world. This one is Lacaria purpurea with the gray cap and the purple gills. Haven't seen many of those this year. And we've got a tree, an old tree. It's having a little trouble. And this is Lacrimaria echiniceps. And generally, in a normal year, you would find a large group of these, you know, nearly encircling a dead or dying tree, but uh, only a couple this year, and it does have the brown spore print there. And this will call Romeria formosa. There's uh, probably a good chance it will undergo taxonomic revision at some point in the future. It's known to be fairly toxic. So that's it from the rivers and forests of Iowa. We'll see you on the next one.